the conspiracy theory minded might reasonably think this is canonical breaking the dubs or you're forced years to snap. Hey everyone, welcome back to Linux Weekly, daily Wednesdays where we sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things going on in the world of Linux and open source. I'm Vince Stone, joined every week by Jill Brian and everybody watching us live here on Twitch. Let's go ahead and get into it. But Jill, you have to celebrate a birthday this week. Oh, absolutely. So we, we're, we're celebrating uh, Linux's birthday. Happy birthday, Linux. Linux turned 32 years old last Friday, August, August 25th. So... That's just amazing. It makes me feel old too. <laughs> yeah, it's 30. At 30, I was like, oh, yeah. Like, oh, 32. Oh, wow. It's been around for a minute. Been there for the entire time. That's always an interesting thing to think about. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we've been using Linux since it was like, hey, here's yeah. this thing to try to get. It was a curiosity, you know, because for a while, I mean, that's all it was. They're like, oh, this is an alternate operating system. And, yeah. It was a different time in the sense that there were alternate operating systems, you know, especially in the uh, early mid 90s. That was still a thing. Even mm -hmm. later on, we, you know, OS 2 was still around and like yeah. it wasn't Windows, Mac, Linux like it is today. We just got these three options. And when you, when you hear about somebody writing a hobby OS these days, you're like, oh, well, that's silly, but you never know. You never know. Oh. And this one turned out to be something that. Most of us run if you're listening to the show. Yes. So. The free version of Unix, not big and GNU <laughs> like Unix, like uh, Linus said in his famous words. <laughs> and I'm going yeah. to save everybody that comment. I'm like, well, actually, <laughs> actually. It was a big deal. <laughs> Linux is a clone of Menix, not Unix. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Moral of the story, you know what I mean, man chill out yeah so <laughs> one of the things i've been playing around with i talked about it a little bit on saturday saturday during linux gamecast weekly was the initial test run i still got a lot of tweaking to do is normally when we do these shows you see these other boxes back here there's two that i rely on for the live stream one is an apex compeller it does the leveling mm. compression it keeps everything nice and level on the live stream and below that is a orban 526a which is a dynamic uh de-esser and these are old pieces of broadcast equipment that I've repurposed in my rack to bring you the audio that we deliver. I hate using them. Mm -hmm. I've always hated using them. I have no love mm -hmm. for outboard gear. I've made my position very clear when it comes to analog equipment that it is yeah. uh, something for hobbyists to play around with. You want to get everything in the box. What's in the box means that you're doing everything digitally, doing it all with plugins, because it's completely possible to do it. It has been for a long, long time. Now, one argument that you might have that I will give you a point for and say you're valid, trying to achieve a desired effect can often be quicker by plugging in an external piece of gear because, you know, it does the thing. You turn the knobs and like, boom, it just, hey, there's the sound I want. And you don't need to understand the underlyings of uh psychoacoustics, uh, harmonic distortion, and all that to like simulate it. But I've been working on that. I found a good open source uh, leveler that is very gradual, very gradual, because I could cut that off right now, and we're still going to sound fine, but it's not going to be quite as punchy as I like it to be. I'll probably be doing a video on it a bit later because there's some bug fixes that need to take place before I'm going to go and say, hey, we're going to go try and use this. And I'm a little bit worried because I'm like, here, here's a crash. I put it on their uh, bug tracker. Mm -hmm. And one of the developers wrote back and it says, how did you even get to that screen? I'm like, oh, no. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm like, here's how you get to the screen. You click that. I, I understand it was supposed to be hidden, but, you know, I know how to read C. Uh, so I knew it was there. Um, it's working pretty good, but it's computationally heavy which was something I was bringing up. Uh, you got to think uh, just the engine. This is why I'm so fascinated by analog computers. And that's what an AFX compeller is. It's uh, mm -hmm. hundred, there's no ICs in there. It's just doing everything with stored voltages to figure out where the level should be to emulate that. It's like the memes, like look what they need to do to generate a fraction of our power. You know, one of those things and uh, Jackbox, Jackbox is squeezing a little bit. It's like, mm. <laughs> This is kind of rough, but it's doing it. We're not getting any X runs. But on top of that, you got to put back in harmonic distortion, which saturation is the word people like to throw around. They're like, mm, I like that warmth. 
Yeah. <laughs> That's distortion. That's what it is. That's what saturation is. It's distortion. Adding that back in is a challenge because if you do it right, you can't hear it. That's where a lot of people mm -hmm. mess up. And stay away from saturation plugins. Those things are all trash. I don't care who makes them. You want to do that with um, sideband compression and probably some type of exciter algorithm. And that's what I'm working on right now. I, I want something that sounds perfectly equal or slightly better because if I, you take that out of the recording, Jill, it's too clean. The yeah, brain clean. doesn't like that. <laughs> like that's, that's too clinical. That's too surgical. And that was a big complaint in the early days of digital audio. Yeah, yeah. Too crisp. <laughs> it was like, it, it doesn't, I was like, yeah, it sounds too perfect, doesn't it? So that's yeah. been my journey for the past couple of days. Is finding out how hard it is to make audio sound bad. <laughs> yeah, a little white noise in there doesn't hurt, right? <laughs> it's uh, if it was that simple, it would be fixed. I probably put, I think I've logged about seven or eight hours. Like, so, but I like a good puzzle to solve, and this might make a good video. And then you're fighting other things like the equivalent of like, what's it going to sound like when it's a uh, pressed to tape or pressed to vinyl back in the day. You still got to work out things like what's it going to sound like once it's been pressed to MP3 because the sound completely changes. Yeah. And then it's all the monitoring and steps like that. Uh, I, I like a good puzzle. Hopefully we'll get it solved. But main reason I'm doing this is once you have everything in the box, now let's say, because we do multi-track, right? We're sitting here talking mm -hmm. and um, maybe motorcycle guy didn't realize it wasn't Saturday. And he comes pulling out of the neighborhood like he does on Saturday and yeah. ripping out in front of my house. Maybe, maybe he's like, I think it's Saturday. So he gets up in, in the middle of the show. But what I'm able to do is uh, I got that track and I can cut that out, right? Mm -hmm. It's not a problem. So if I need to do that, well, but Jill's talking, say I, I'm not muted and that goes over Jill's talking like, and you can't hear what she's saying. Okay, so I need to go back and pull that out my audio track while Jill's talking. Previously, when you have outboard gear, you got to do everything in real time. Uh, so yeah. I have to re-render everything back out at one-to-one. -one. And I got to mm -hmm. cut all this back on. And it's not portable. I got to light everything up, cut all the equipment back up, get a recall sheet. When it's all digital, I can do it on any PC. I'm doing a laptop. I can do it on Jill's PC. I'm like, doop, 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 click rendering it out at 16x real time. Mm -hmm. Makes it real easy to fix things. And I, I even was able to, uh, I didn't want to, but I was able to do that on Saturday. I'm like, I need to fix mm -hmm. the thing. Boom. Done. So real happy with that. Yay, Stay tuned. Man. Maybe some guides on it. Who knows? I still got to do it. I still got to get that Kona thing out. Maybe, maybe by Friday I'll have that out for patrons. I have already written it. I just got to find the time to sit down and read the thing that I've wrote and, and stick everything together. So <laughs> stay You're written. Tuned. I have written it. <laughs> you got to written it. And then you got to go through the process. If you write a script, you read through it. Even though you, you vocalize it, you don't find the problems with it until you're sitting down actually tracking it. And it's a long process. It's pretty boring. Maybe I should just throw away the script and go, what's up, fam? Video card, go burr and roll some credits. Maybe mm -hmm. put a pink one picture at the end. It'll be awesome. Let's go ahead and get into it for this week. Yeah. I-386 <laughs> and Ubuntu will not die. Why is that, Joe? Oh, boy. Because <laughs> we have to have those old drivers to play well when our old games <laughs> under Steam. <laughs> yeah, this, this has been an, an issue uh, for a while. And uh, Popey uh, uh, goes into detail about it and uh well you you remember then back in june of 2019 ubuntu attempted to take out the 32-bit uh drivers <laughs> from the os which stopped lots of software and games from working correctly <laughs> and uh yeah 2019 was kind of interesting um, yeah <laughs> we were talking about it a lot on the gaming show because it Kind of came as a shock, man. Uh, yeah, dropping all 32-bit support, 
beginning with the upcoming Ubuntu 19.10 release at the time. So what would that get rid of? Oh boy, you're talking about all of your wine applications because yeah. Wine 64 <laughs> still isn't even in that state. All of the Steam stuff. And, you know, in less than a month, it was a couple of weeks, Canonical, they reversed, reversed course on that. And they're like, okay, because everyone went, have you lost your mind? Including Valve, because Steam announced after they did that that they were no longer supported future Ubuntu releases. They made that announcement like, we're out. We're not, we're, we're not even going to mess with that. And that's one of the many reasons the Steam Deck's running Arch, not Ubuntu. Yeah. There's yeah, an alternate exactly. trajectory there where the Steam Deck is running Ubuntu. And I think this played no small part in it. But the reason we want to bring this up is uh, somebody discovered that if you were trying to install Steam, or I have to imagine any other type of a 32-bit application on what version of uh, Ubuntu? Because this has been out for a while, Jill. This is not a... Yeah, it was uh, 24... 23.04. 23.04, yeah. <laughs> 2304, especially if you tried to install Steam from the repo, it just went, wasn't going to happen. Wouldn't work. And that's because uh, Canonical has that new Flutter based installer. And somebody forgot to add 32 bit support to the image. I know. It was something, <laughs> it was a simple mistake. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's not what the thread on uh, Mastodon is like. This is a conspiracy. Even Popey took a stab <laughs> at it, too. He, he, yeah. he did. He, he said, uh, you know, uh, the thread on Mastodon brought up, a, you know, an expected thought process. Uh, the conspiracy theory minded might reasonably think this is canonical breaking the dead, so you're forced years to snap. But it doesn't appear no. to be the case. <laughs> no. This is one of those things where if, if somebody said, but they really did, I'd be like, possibly. But, you know, don't, don't ascribe malice as uh, what can be described as just, you know, oopsies. Yeah, it looks like an oopsie. But I wanted to give everyone a mention, like, because I know some people out there are still running the Ubuntu. So I'm like, what is going on? What's the solution? Just go download the deb from Valve directly. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, because of these issues of Steam on Ubuntu, I've always installed the Valve Steam dot deb, uh, uh, and not use the ones in the Ubuntu repositories because there's just a lot of issues, and I just av avoid it by. Going to uh, Valve and installing, downloading Steam, and um, I've had issues with System76 Pop OS Steam client in the Pop Shop also with the 32-bit drivers, and even they recommend installing Valves instead. And every every time I actually install the uh, Valve Steam Deb, the i386 drivers get installed mm -hmm. automatically, so it fixes all the issues. <laughs> That is a uh, like, and then Popey discovered that too <laughs> in the article. <laughs> That's my gem. Like when I need to set up yeah. to make sure all the graphic acceleration and everything for a uh, Debian install is set up out of the box. Even if I'm not going to run Steam on that box, I install Steam because it pulls everything you need. And yeah, there you go. Let, let's go back to the original packaging format. That Deb thing. I had a problem with this on Debian. Debian's got its own problems. Like Debian will stop you out of the gate because i386 is not a uh, architecture mm. that's supported out of the box. So if you try to install Steam, it's like, mm -mm. and you're going to be Googling if you don't know to add that automatically. <laughs> yeah. But there we go. Like use the original Deb. It's going to take care of you. Uh, stay away from your flat packs. Stay away. I mean, these are <laughs> these are solutions <laughs> desperately in search of a problem. Um, I didn't even know they had a snap. Okay, I think we yeah, the might snap have talked doesn't... about it does include the 32-bit drivers, which is really nice. But, you know, of course, it loads a bit slower and eh, it, it's not not the best performing, but it does work. <laughs> that That's not what I look for in an application. <laughs> Technically yeah. launches. I'm like, <laughs> uh, yeah, moral of that story is just grab that deb. Uh, maybe reconsider uh, what Linux distribution you're using. But, this, you know, if you're using, there's nothing wrong with a, uh, Ubuntu these days, mm -hmm. if, if that's your thing. Yeah. However, maybe you want to upgrade your kernel because I compile kernels all the time. I was compiling yeah. kernels earlier this week. I'm going to do it again because I'm stripping things for parts because I'm working on a project I'm not talking about right now. Yes. And um, <laughs> I might tell everyone about it if I ever decide to do anything with it. You version of the kernels up 6.5. Yeah. And Vin's probably already compiled it as we speak. <laughs> so. So yeah, it it was not only 
uh, Linux's 32nd birthday this last week, we got a new kernel on Sunday to, to celebrate it. So uh, Linux creator Linus Torvalds released Linux kernel 6.5, and it's, it's got some very important f new features, actually extremely important new features. It doesn't seem to be quite as packed as uh, kernel 6.4, but it's still got some very needed uh, additions to the kernel. And one is actually debugpoint.com states on their article about the new Linux kernel 6.5. For users of high core count Intel Xeon, AMD Epic, and high-end desktop processor, this release is bringing parallel CPU boot support aimed at significantly reducing kernel boot times. And something else that's really important that I know is important for Venn is there is now complete MIDI 2.0 support. And the kernel now defaults to using the AMD P-State EPP driver. So us users with AMD Ryzen, Ryzen Zen 2 or newer should expect performance gains and improved power efficiency with Linux kernel 6.5. And one of my favorites Im improvements to the new Linux kernel is AMD FreeSync now enabled by default in the kernel. So I use FreeSync enabled monitors for all my AMD GPUs. And uh, that's just, that makes life so much easier to just have it autom automatically enabled. And just going to improve our, our gaming life as well. <laughs> bunch of new things, a bunch of interesting things in 6.5. Uh, 6.6 six is something I'm keeping an eye on for a completely different reason. Everybody heard of this company mm. called NVIDIA? Yeah. 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 <laughs> well. Um, Team Green. <laughs> they're going to be throwing a wrench in NVIDIA's uh, playbook because uh, it's going to get real interesting. And get real interesting uh, running your NVIDIA drivers on the uh, Linux kernel starting with 6.6 uh, because NVIDIA has like circumvented the um, protection put in place back in 2020 to prevent proprietary modules from uh, hooking up with uh, GPL only symbols. Mm. Like, hmm, we see what you're doing, NVIDIA. We're going to stop you from doing that. We're just going to have to find a different uh, strategy. So yeah. um, nothing like earth breaking in 6.5, but. Yeah, Still a good important. release, solid release, yeah. and plenty to look at. Now, we've all probably had a Commodore 64 at least. If you haven't, you've watched somebody mm -hmm. on YouTube with a C64, and you're like, oh, wow, that thing was, well, quite miserable back in the day. I, for what it cost, it was all right, but I never got big into the microcomputer craze. You know, I had the Spec B, I had the C64. I read applications wrote in applications for both of them. And like, I, I, I never developed that. Like, this was the greatest PC ever. I'm like, I can't wait to get an <laughs> x86 PC. Uh, and I finally get one. However, maybe you're sitting around and you're like, man, you know what my C64 needs? Linux. Absolutely. You can make that dream a reality. <laughs> the butt does it run Linux joke. It's going to be kind of <laughs> over with this guy. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it it's here. It does with some caveats. <laughs> Some caviars are definitely thrown in there because um, <laughs> Anno Kortman has taken Simo. Now, what is that? That's a minimal Risk Five emulator. Cross compiled it with LLMV MOS. Okay, mm -hmm. an LM, LLMV port to the MOS sixty five hundred two processor in order to get Linux up and running on the uh, C sixty four. Now, my first thought was, surely this will not fit in sixty four K of RAM. <laughs> Lo and behold, it does not. It requires a 16 meg or a U module, which, okay, that exists. Also, there's going to be a small problem here. Not really a problem. Okay, maybe we shouldn't say a problem. There's a little bit of a warning. In, on real hardware, um, it'll probably take about a week to boot. It's a boot, <laughs> yeah. Because the 6502, very poorly suited to anything that reminds you of C-style coding. However, uh, you know, in synthetic, it does launch. Like, there it is. Why Amazing. would you want to do it? You don't need a why, just because you can. Why yeah. Not? Can you do anything useful with it? No, but come on. 
It can run Linux. You can just tell people to shut up. I'm like, oh, can it run Linux? Like, yeah, it does. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's as important as running Doom. <laughs> yeah, so this is really exciting news. You know, I actually, one of the reasons I'm excited about this is because I have a C64 and a C128 in my collection. And it, it would run on my C128 as well if it runs here because I actually have more more memory, which is nice, more RAM. And uh, it's, it's, it's really cool if you follow the history of the C64. Um, back in the 90s, there was a distro called LUnix or Little Unix. It's a Unix-like operating system, system developed for the C64 and C128. And um, I actually never had seen this running in person, but I've, I've seen videos on it. And that was really interesting. And, you know, it's the closest we've gotten to a Linux Commodore 64 port until now. <laughs> That's just a big deal. And, yeah, Vin, so I was in junior high when the C64 was introduced in early 1982. In fact, I remember the day me and my family went to Toys R Us to buy one. And I still have it in my vintage computer collection as well. <laughs> I remember my mom brought me home one see the thing. Do you want a little toy computer? Oh, <laughs> how old were you? <laughs> Do I don't you know, remember I was probably how like five or six. Oh, okay. So later, after it came out, <laughs> it and, was uh, it was sold until the the nineties. That was amazing. oh yeah, um, yeah. Like I said, I never got like in my household. Like microcomputers were not uh, spoken well of. They were like they, they were toys, and but they were affordable, <laughs> and a lot of people got their start on them. Yeah. So they got that, and if like this is more of like you look at it, you're like, man, that's neat. I respect the work that went into that, just on the principle, of, like we're gonna make this happen. And there it is. There'll be a link in the show notes, though. So don't worry about uh, having to search high and low and sideways in order to find everything. Head over to LinuxGameCast.com. After the fact, there'll probably be a link in the uh, show description. Go check that out. Yeah. Now, <laughs> one thing I've been looking forward for a long time is a replacement for what I call co-host boxes. Because I have three of them that yeah. we use on the show. I have uh, the one that Jill's on does double duty. It's the Joe Box, actually triple duty. It's the Joe Box, Jordan Box, and the Trek Mania Box. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we had to get creative. It's like uh, out of the three boxes, one is like obscenely overpowered because it also has to play Trek Mania. Um, and the other two are just little butter robots. You know, they're One's, uh, well, both of them right now are 3010 Dell business PCs. You know, they are four core uh, i7s from a decade ago. Not the most power efficient thing in the world, but they're super cheap. And they're mm -hmm. really, really, you know, they're business machines. They're super reliable. Yeah, they're really reliable. Yeah. I want my floor <laughs> back is what uh, I want. Uh, okay. Because you want to be get, able to stick the computers behind the monitors? I, <laughs> <laughs> that, I'm not even that ambitious. What okay. I want is to be able to zip tie them to the desk under the table. There you go. Yeah. You now, up until now, like Raspberry, even the Raspberry Pi 4, 8 gig, I'm like, I don't even need 8 gigs. I'm do 4 gigs. Pretty sure I can do 4 gigs. Um, not quite there. What did that, what did those machines, uh, now the rectangle box has to say because it's got to run track media. Mm -hmm. But the other two boxes, they got to be able to run WebRTC. They got to be able to handle a video capture card and they need to be able to handle a fiber card. That that's the rough one, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, that's one at a left field. You're like, okay, we can do that. Okay. Maybe we okay. <laughs> 10 gig fiber card. Hmm. Don't know how we're going to pull that off. Joel. Yeah. <laughs> well, you might be able to Ven with this raspberry Pi alternative called a Zima board. The Zima board is a low cost single board server for makers and geeks, states the manufacturer's website. And, and that it is. The big news here though, is that the Zima board is an Intel x86 quad core single board computer instead of the Raspberry Pi's ARM single board computer. Very cool. It has a very unique and stylish design with its upper side um, and consisting entirely of metal cooling fins for passive cooling, which is really cool. And it has something else exciting, a PCIe slot that protrudes 
on its side. And at the bottom, there is a partially transparent plastic. Eh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Back it up, back yeah. it up. That's a buy four PCI Express slot on the top. That's all anyone cares about. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes. Other stuff there. I'm sure that let's get Other back to this stuff, PCI yeah. Express slot sticking out of the side. I know. On. It's, that's the important thing here. So, yes, you can install that, you know, NVIDIA or AMD GPU if you would like. <laughs> and because it is a fully capable computer, it actually has on board the Intel um, uh, HD, what was it, the 500, I believe. Yeah. HD 500, 200 megahertz base, up to 700 First, uh, we get them in a couple different models, 2 gig, 4 gig, and 8 gig, uh, and that's going to scale linearly with the 35, 3350 dual core or mm -hmm. the 3450 quad core or the pin 34 quad core again, but with 8 gigs of RAM. Yeah, nice. <laughs> nice. And it, what's cool about it also is it has four small black Phillips screws on the bottom, which also make the board easy to open. Uh, nope, I don't want to. I, I, I only want Phillips heads. <laughs> you know, flat head, like, no. Mm -mm. Yeah, no, I want flat heads. <laughs> Gotta be flat. No, it's dead <laughs> Gotta to be me. flat. <laughs> or or, or star-shaped, possibly, <sighs> to be a pain to open up. <laughs> Man, I'm looking at it, and the only thing that I'm just like, oh, no, is it's got the uh, micro display port thing on mm -hmm. it. That's yeah. a gnarly little cable, and I say that with somebody with micro display port plugged into a monitor right now. I'm uh, right. Oh, look at that on the other end, Jill. That's SATA ports, isn't it? I know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, there's so there's so much many good things about this computer. I hope you get one, Vin, so we can uh, talk about it. The uh, <laughs> like it's gonna be silly. I think here's somebody. There we go. Okay, now this is gonna be one of the problems. With plugging in the old uh, GPU there, because you might have to take the base plate off. Oh, okay. the mounting bracket or whatever you yeah. want to call it, uh, in order for it to slide down. Because there, there's like a little bit of oversight. We didn't think about yeah. that. Like, yeah, that's yeah. Gonna be a problem. That's but then right, again, yeah. let's be realistic. You don't need that plate anyway because there's nothing to mount it to, right? Yeah. Or you could just get one of the little little uh, PCIe extenders. Risers. To, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it does. Run uh, about forty three to forty three C. That's one hundred nine point four freedom units, and uh, I was impressed by the power usage of this little guy because mm -hmm. it is uh, like they said, like completely clocked out. This thing's only using about ten watts. That's kind of wild. That's yeah, kind of wild. <laughs> um, it depends on. See, I want to see where it starts throttling. If I need to put any type of cooling on it, yeah. and. Uh, you know, my first thought is like the Zima. That's an interesting name. But let's just go ahead and get this over with real quick. <laughs> pricing. There's the prices. You, we could have named off all these stats. And it's like, all of that's useless if this is $500, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Because we've seen these boards and like, oh, they don't even have the price on. We're like, inquire here. I'm like, well, we just know we can't afford it. So let's not. This thing's starting the Zima board 2016. What's it going to get you? That's going to get you a dual core. Two gigajoules of RAM, 16 gigs EM MMC. Uh, you still get the two dual gigabit Ethernet, that SATA, and everything's on the case. Um, $119. Mm hmm. Okay. Good price. I'm and interested. The, yeah. And the next level up is, uh, is the Zima board 432, which is $159 or, or $160. Mm hmm. Um, a quad core. Uh, 1.1 1 .1 to 2.4 gigahertz, four gigabytes of dual channel RAM, 32 gigabytes of eMMC storage, two SATA six gig ports, and so on. <laughs> and of course, you got your top end model, which is more yeah. of the same. It's just got eight gigs of RAM on it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, I think I should get the four gig model, but I want to. I'm, I'm really thinking I want to get the two gig version. Because oh. I think I can squeeze everything I need into two gigs. Okay. I'm I'm not a hundred percent on that. Do you do you think how many how many gigs of a uh, memory RAM do you think you're using right now, Joe? Uh, probably uh, three. <laughs> three. So, Let's yeah. find out how much RAM Jill's using right now. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh. Oh, on my uh, little computer, probably one point five. Let's say. One point five. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody, you ready? We're, we're saying 1.5. Mm -hmm. Let's find out. Dun, dun, dun. 
Mm-hmm. One. One point, not, not eight. One. Okay. One. There we go. That's good for <laughs> <laughs> my little Dell opt- Optiplex. Oh, this is not the Optiplex. <laughs> this is rectangle. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is a 5600G. So, I mean, <laughs> uh, but yeah, the memory is really the only thing because you can see like the WebRTC is not heavy at all. Again, this is 5600G, bad, bad example, but I mean, it's still not going to uh, max out, I would hope. Yeah. Uh, hang on, let me make sure I don't alt it for years. There we go. Um, it's not going to max out, uh, I would hope, the uh, celery. 3350. Okay. But the only thing I'm curious about, I, I think it's even the 2K guy. I'd be more impressed with myself if I did it on the 2K, let's be honest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> where well, maybe it's, if you bought two, the 2 gig one and the 4 gig that's one. A, and then that's you not can... going to save money now, is it? <laughs> that, that's, that's just un, that is unchecked hoarding at play right there, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. Hmm, if I bought two, uh, <laughs> no. Uh, we're we're gonna, probably going to get the uh, Zimboard. 216, because, you know, I, I want to find out where it thermal throttles, because this thing will thermal throttle. There. It's completely uh, passive cool. We can put a fan on it, see what we can do to make it scream. Yeah. That might be fun. That might be fun. Then again, maybe I'll turn into, like, the uh, big spender, and uh, even even the top end one, not expensive, really, is it? No. 199 bucks, like, cool piece of kit. I was joking with Jill in the pre-show. I was like, you know what? Let's take like the $119 one and plug a $1,000 capture card into it. See yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because if you go on YouTube, you can already find people like plugging in, you know, like 4090s and stuff to it. I want to see what kind of practical uses we can get up to. Maybe turn it into, uh, uh, I don't know, because it's got those drive uh, SATA ports on it. This thing's like built for a NAS of some sort, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it did, it definitely said server <laughs> based, so it has all the ports for it. Yeah. <laughs> and it comes with Linux on it. I couldn't find what Which kind one? of Linux. Yeah. Oh, uh, but it's x86, so I can run anything on it. Yeah, absolutely. We could spend an entire afternoon in a live stream getting Windows 311 up on this bad boy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we sure can. <laughs> and we could crowdsource. <laughs> An issue request with all the problems we've run into. Can you imagine getting uh-huh. the support ticket? Be like, trying to get, like, hey, what's going on here? I can get my operating system up and running Windows 11 <laughs> for work groups. Well, you that, can run lots of things virtually, like Commodore 64 Basic. <laughs> never know, man. Uh, Casa <laughs> OS. You saw it in the uh, article. Oh. Yeah. Well, I mean, it comes with that on it. We'll find out. Like, because, like, step number one would be. Debian, but uh, stay tuned. I, I got a stack of uh, hardware videos I got to get done, but we will eventually get to this. And um, you know what? If you want to help us get to this, you can head over to LinuxTeamCast.com, fill our coffers, line it with tens of pennies and maybe a few quarters. If that's your thing, become a Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast. We got a gang of things, rewards, mm-hmm. bonus things that you get. For helping us out, subscribe on Twitch. Speaking of Twitch subscribers, I want to thank Gamatron and Mir for resubscribing. Yay! Y'all awesome. You know you are. We got awesome. LibrePay, PayPal, a bunch of different ways. We got wish list over there uh, for that mm-hmm. Amazon thing. Jordan's got one. Jill's got one. Pedro's got one. I got one more for the studio. I always warn you, I will publicly shame you if you get anything for the studio. So I don't want to hear any complaints. We got a merch store and Amazon storefront, Humble Affiliate. Any way you can help us out. We would appreciate it. And yeah, we convert that into hosting. And one thing you might notice is like we don't host with like uh, whoever's mm-hmm. Sharky's hosting shack, whatever, taking all the data and all that. We do all that stuff here locally to that expense. One thing I did put out, I just put it out for everybody. Something I like to help people out with. Something, I, a resource I would have found invaluable when I started doing this. Dry tracks for podcast mixing. You want to learn how to podcast. More importantly, you want to learn how to edit a podcast. But you don't have anybody to edit the podcast with. I'm just trying to get started. What do you do? You head over. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, just go to our social media right now. If you go to Twitter, if you go to uh, Mastodon, there's a link to the LGC archive on archive.org, where I have try yeah. unprocessed multitracks. And it was our show, LWW from last week that was posted. Clean, ready to go, so you can practice making a <laughs> podcast which is always great. I would have killed to have those 10 years ago. (laughs) And we're able to do stuff like that. Thanks to viewers like you. Ting. 
Uh, but yeah, extra big thanks to Gimitron for uh, 22 months, and I don't know how many months Mir has. How many months does uh, Mir have? <laughs> yeah, Mir, we, I missed how many months you had. I'm going to go find <laughs> out. Let me see. Yeah. <laughs> Let me go to... I have to go to... You would have to uh, hack into my Twitch account. Yeah. Well, I could go uh, see the video from... 46 months. Mm -hmm. Oh, 46. There we go. Okay, from Saturday, I think it was posted. I can't remember. <laughs> uh, like two days ago. Mm. Oh, whenever two days ago was, I'm not sure. I think it might be Wednesday. Who knows? Uh, yeah, that's it. We got to run. We're over yes. time. Because the bouncy, bouncy music that I love. The bouncy music. <laughs> Aww. This is, a, this is really fun. Aww. And uh, oh yeah, Steve Husband said that was funny that he said that the the Zima board looks like an old uh, GPU. <laughs> He's right. <laughs> Thank you to our executive producers, our advisors, including our Theron and Chat, our Sea Monsters, <laughs> our Death Notes, lots of them, <laughs> and our Chairlings. There's so many awesome patrons. We love you all. <laughs> all right, beautiful people. We're going to wrap up episode 390. See you again next week. Same time. If you listen to that for the fact yeah. you catch a live show, I dare you. I won't, I won't tell your parents. Probably. Oh, hi, Kai Doobie. Good to see you in chat, too. Bye, everyone. See you next week. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.